Good morning and welcome to our first Digital Mobile Speaker Series uh, presenter of the year. Uh, I'm delighted that Kelvin Collard is here. Uh, Kelvin is uh, Executive Vice President and Chief Financial and Administrative Officer for Universal Weather and Aviation. You will have to figure out what that is from his talk. Right? It's a very interesting business concept. Uh, it's a global business aviation trip management company. 47 locations in 19 countries. Kelvin brings 33 years of accounting, finance, and business experience from a wide variety of industries and businesses, and he holds a BBA in accounting from Lamar University. His career began with what was then Coopers and Librand, one of the original Big Eight accounting firms, is now part of uh, PWC, one of the final four, as we now say. After nine years in public accounting, he expanded his career and embarked on an opportunity with Atlantic Richfield Company for 12 years where his assignments went from financial reporting uh, to analysis to controller at several subsidiary companies, including Lyondell Chemical Company, where he spent most of his time. While, while at Lyondell, he led the implementation of an ERP system and the integration and consolidation of the controller's function. Prior to joining Universal, Kelvin was the chief financial officer of the Brock Group, a private equity-owned specialty maintenance contractor. Within 16 months, he helped acquire six companies that increased the size of the company over seven times its original size. Again, we're delighted to have Kelvin Pillard with us. He asked me to give a brief, he started basically giving you my uh, brief resume. But let me kind of tell you about a little bit about my path that I took before I get started with the presentation. I, I came here out of Houston. I, I don't know, from Beaumont. I actually was doing some research and trying to find a smaller school that had a great accounting department. And this at the time, way back then, had one of the best. In fact, all of the big eight at the time came and, and, inter and interviewed and pulled students out of, out of here and took them all over to Houston, Dallas, and what have you. So that was what I wanted to do. I uh, decided to go to college, I decided to be an accountant. And I had met a young a staff accountant when I was working at a, a warehouse and they do inventory at Christmas. So this beautiful little girl came in, and I'm you know, 18 year old, sort of in awe of this person. And I had to ask all these questions about what they do. But, uh, she was working for a big A. So I said, that's what I want. So I came here, I got my degree, and, and went to work for Cooper's and Librand, which is now Pricewaterhouse Cooper, with the intent of becoming a partner. And I uh, spent about nine years, did a, did a host of different things different industries. I actually made, uh, spent a few years in New Orleans at their office <coughs> before coming back to Houston. And uh, the, only, the only thing that got in the way was I had a, a customer, a client, that, that came to me after I helped them do an IPO and said, we, we need somebody like you. And uh, they offered to double my salary. And so I was like, well, you know, I've got my second child's on the way. Uh, what's wrong with this? Maybe I should try that. And so I decided that, you know, I'd get out of public accounting. And uh, then I said, well, what do I want to set my, my goal for next? And so that was, well, I want to be a CFO. So, you know, you kind of try to figure out what it is that I have to do to, to get to there. So I uh, tried to broaden my uh, horizons outside of accounting. I ended up going you know, to uh, our pro Atlantic Richfield, spent some time in their corporate headquarters, got to travel a little bit around the world, moved to Denver. I was, that's when I became controller of their coal division. And we had uh, coal mines, not only in the United States, but in Australia. And we were looking to uh, open up some coal mines in the Gobi Desert. Uh, and you'll find out when you work with China, some things just don't seem to get done. You can spend 10 years on things and still not close it out, and we never did. I left there, came back to Houston to, uh, to work with Lyondale Chemical. At the time, Lyondale was owned by ARCA. And I came back with the understanding that they were about to spend them off. But I had the opportunity to be, become an officer in the company. I was the vice president controller. We combined, uh, we, we, we basically combined several petrochemical companies into one. I think uh, Lyondale went from about, about a $3 billion company to about a $4 billion, $14 billion company at that time. As he said, I, uh, we, we implemented SAP. Uh, during that period, right? Uh, if anybody heard of Y2K, uh, that was, a, you know, that was to me the biggest, scariest 
the big scare tactic of IT that there ever really was. And we rushed and implemented SAP, you know, I think on November of 1999. So we just barely made it. Uh, very good experience. I mean, I, I implemented a couple of ERP systems since then, and I can tell you that that's been my model, the way that they uh, organized that and, and the way we had ever every department, every business line kind of focus on that, put their best people on it. And that's really what you need to do. When you don't, you uh, you have a higher risk of not being successful. Um, so, so at Lyondale, most of you know it's a chemical company, refining chemical engineers are the ones that uh, run that place. And I realized fairly early that I was never going to be CFO of Lyondale because I didn't have a chemical engineering degree. And I was not about to go back and get one. <laughs> so um, I said, well, what am I going to do? So I, I kind of put my third career in order and said, well, I'm going to go out and, and see if I can become a CFO. So what I wanted to do, uh, I ended up getting with some private equity firms. Who, and what private equity firms do is they go buy well, mainly private companies, they lever them up, they put a whole lot of debt on them, and then they use them, many times they'll use them as a platform to buy other companies in that same uh, industry to just roll them up and make them big enough to where they create a lot of value and then they sell them. So if you come in early, they give you some, some options and some other types of incentives, and when they get ready to sell it, then you have the chance to make a lot of money. So I thought, well, that's a good idea. Let's just try that for a while. Well, I spent 10 years working with private equity firms. And I can tell you, when you're highly levered, you can have one little pickup, and immediately the, uh, the value just sort of evaporates. And you go from the PE firm being your best friend to your worst enemy, because they don't care about the long term. They don't care about the necessarily the viability of the business. They, they now want to get their money out of it, not, not lose too much. So I had, a, I had a lot of, I guess, school of hard knocks. I didn't pick very well the companies that I got to join that not 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 even not well there's one of them that's still out there but they haven't all hit yet. So I've got a few stock options and a couple of companies out there that I'm still waiting on. But again it's very difficult. You always hear about the successes. You hear about the four or five times you know they made their money but you never hear about uh, the uh, ones that don't quite make it. And there's probably more of those out there than so I, after that, I, uh, I got a call from a headhunter about this company called, uh, called Universal, privately owned. And I thought, well, you know, I've, been, I've done the public, I've done the private equity. You know, this, this will be a little bit, bit different. Uh, definitely not the uh, stress and the uh, hard work that we were doing uh, in these other firms where you just didn't have enough people. People, so I said, let's let's look into this. So I did. And, uh, no point in this thing. Nope. Are you pressing not the button? The side. The side. Yeah. They work. They work. Well, good. Weather Aviation, purely a entrepreneurial created company. This, this man named Tom Evans created the company in 1959. He was a weatherman. He just got out of the Air Force, was working in Dallas, and realized that pilots were having difficulty getting uh, you know, weather forecasts for their flights. And they could just go to the National Weather Service, but they were fairly generic, you know, just basic areas, but not a specific weather forecast for the entire ground. So he saw that niche and he, and he jumped on it and he, and he started doing that. And that's really at the very beginning of general aviation. And back then there wasn't too many corporate planes. They were 
uh, mostly big planes that, that a handful of folks were starting to, to travel in. You had the prop planes, the small turbos. Uh, but as he, as he went along, industry matured, they started asking him, well, can you do this and can you do that? And, you know, most of the time these folks needed help going overseas. And when you go overseas, way back then, you had to take a suitcase full of money because you had no credit. And you landed, you didn't know who was going to meet your plane, you didn't know how safe it was going to be, all these kind of things. And so he, he saw an opportunity there, and he just began offering services and services. We've grown to about a little bit over 1,700 employees. Uh, last year, our gross revenue was 1.1 billion. And uh, again, it's it's an interesting place. Very, very family oriented. They really care about their employees, and, and as a result, the employees who, who basically nominated this is nominated, and we have been one of the best places to work in the last uh, seven years. Again, we're a leading provider of trip management solutions for business jet operators. What that means is when you get ready to fly, let's say you're going to go fly to, uh, to Moscow. You know, you, you're going to need a flight plan. A flight plan determines, you know, how, how you prepare your flight plan determines uh, basically your, your equipment. What's the equipment? What's the, what's the load? Based on that, you figure out where you have to fly from tech stops, which is to get fuel along the way. If you fly over countries, they want you to have a permit. If you don't have a permit, so the, more likely than not, they'll be one of their uh, jets ask you to come down. You know, they basically follow you down, and that has happened. It's not good. Uh, so you do that. You, you uh, provide landing slots, landing permits. You know, when your plane lands, there needs to be someone to meet you there, so we arrange either third parties or, like, like uh, Dr. said, we are uh, 40 locations in 19 countries where we have our own people who meet your plan. So, so we do all those things. In addition, we actually have, I don't know, over 4,000 vendors that we don't do everything <coughs> necessary for, for a flight. So we have over 4,000 vendors that we have vetted, that we've got contracts in, that, that we have credit with, that, that allows them to do work for our customers on our behalf. And so that's, that's more or less what we do. We, this year, this past year, we've facilitated over 73,700 legs. And a trip leg is from takeoff to land. That's one of them. Okay? And, and we have uplifted and sold uh, over 143 million gallons. We're kind of working on our five-year plan these days. And our and the guy that's running our fuel, uh, he, he wanted to put together a, a BHAG. Anybody know what a BHAG is? Okay. Big, hairy ass <laughs> And so his goal in five years is to sell 250 million. And it sounds like a lot, and it is, but in this part, in this part of our business, we probably have the smallest uh, uh, market share. This is sort of a, gotta give you an idea of what we do from, from pre planning. Pilot call says I'm about ready to do a trip. We start all the logistics and, and coming up with arranging things. In flight, we provide information. There, there are there are actual uh, communications that can go back and forth between us and that pilot and his plane. Aircraft arrive. We talk about you know making sure all the arrangements are executed and ready to go when they land. I mean you can imagine one one of the things that happens with us is a trip. Each leg, a trip will change on average four times. Or takes off. So that's why they want us to do this because all of this has to be, be, be reset. You're, you're off 30 minutes, sometimes you have to get another landing slot. You know, if you want the, the ground hand people to, to be there when you land, you've got to change all that. So it, it's a, a lot of logistics that go into what we do. And finally, we actually have a post trip kind of uh, debrief. Obviously, we, we, we collect all the invoices from all around the world. We, con we convert them to U.S. dollar, and then we send that on to the uh, to the customer. And then we do some things. Since I've been there, we, we looked at, and now for a new service where we can offer VAT recovery or VAT-free fuel if you are exempt. And again, you have to go through a process. Uh, and it's, the government in, in Europe requires some level of documentation to prove that. But that's become 
very valuable and it seemed uh, allowed us to really increase our sales. So that's kind of what we do. Um, again, this is a picture that just kind of shows where we're at, where we've got uh, our folks around the world. And there's some pictures of uh, some of our locations around the world. I think that one has to be our plane. We have, we have a G-150 that our owner loves to fly around the world. All right, so uh, what kind of got me excited about coming to Universal. As I said, it's very entrepreneurial. And I like to I like to say that Greg, who is our CEO, he's one of these guys that he shoots and then he goes, get ready and aim. <laughs> so I mean he is he'll fly out and he'll he about once a quarter he'll fly overseas and he loves Asia. And he'll come back from Asia and he'll have three locations that he wants to open up. And they're very complicated. I mean you've got some of those some countries that you just can't come in as an, uh, an American, you have to have a partner. So now you've got to find a reputable partner. And you have to go through all kinds of red tape. Uh, sometimes there's not opportunities on that field. You've got to find another field. So he's just, he's just loving to do that. He just, he's always out there trying to find out new opportunities. So very entrepreneurial. And as a result, they, they grew to the size that they are. And with any kind of entrepreneurial company, after a period of time, you get to the size where you need a little structure. Uh, they had a couple of hiccups that really cost them some money because they went too fast and they just didn't have the right processes and procedures and controls in place. So that's what they decided to do. They, they went out and looked for a CFO that had been there and done that. And in my career, I had created some departments. I have done a lot of reorganization a lot of implementation, so uh, I'm kind of like a change agent that just kind of goes around and finds new opportunities and things that get me excited. So this one, <laughs> this one was a really big challenge, a really big challenge. First time I, I attended our executive uh, committee meeting where we monthly go through um, financials. We go in there and the financial folks go in they begin an analysis and immediately Everybody's sort of challenging the numbers. Well, that number's not right. And, and, no, there's no way I did better than that. And I mean, I'm sitting there thinking, <laughs> all right, so when are we going to get to what's it really telling us? What kind of decisions should we be making? Should we make a course correct? I never got there. I never got there. We were just, just basically annihilated every month by challenging the numbers. And so, and they were, and these guys were good about asking about for a lot of data. And they would ask for data and ask for data and ask for data. And they'd get it and they'd look at it, and they literally would almost, I mean, they didn't say heads or tails, but they were pretty close. They just would, okay, what's my gut tell me? Let's go do it. So I thought that was pretty appropriate. So where were we? When I got there, they had very manual processes. Lots of spreadsheets. Uh, we had different systems in every country. Uh, Greg would go to these countries. He would find somebody to run it. He'd say, I want you to set it up, run it. He'd walk off, and they would have to do everything. And they made, they made all the decisions. So when you got information from them, you got summary information. So very, very, uh, very manual. Unintegrated systems, lots of reconciliations, lots of combinations consolidation effort. We spent all of our time just trying to compile the information and put the reports together. No time to do any analysis, any quality analysis, let's put that one. Uh, very lack of focus on employee development. Uh, when I came into the finance group, uh, it was a very uh, interesting group. Uh, most of the people had been there for a long time. They grew up with the owner. And again, not all instances, but many instances, the company had outgrown it. And they just didn't know how to take it to that next level. So what I want to do is, is a transformation. Uh, and, and again, being the best financial organization means one trusted partner. We wanted to be a partner with the businesses. We wanted them to view us as part of them and not somebody that either was criticizing what they were doing or just somebody who just you know, closed the books and records and invoices. 
we want to be one team because we weren't. Worldwide, we were just a bunch of different teams. Uh, we wanted to do everything one time, <coughs> not do it, then fix it, fix it again before it's final, and one version of the truth. And again, that, that sounds kind of basic, but it's a lot harder to do. Keep the wrong button on. Okay. This sort of a picture of what I'm trying to do. Uh, again, it, it took a, it's going to take a very big cultural change. If you look at the, the pyramid on the left, you, know, you, can, you can see that transaction processing is taking an inordinate amount of time, very little time for decision support. What I want to do is take us toward the other one where we do 40% of everything we do is decision support. That's analysis, that's not, a, not writing a report, that's looking at the numbers, trying to understand what they're telling us, and be able to, to, to tell and work with that business leader. Uh, the enablers, and we'll talk about that, it's you know, organizational alignment. How do we align our organization to fit what we're doing? Skills development, process redesign, we had to do a lot of that. Improved systems, and we had a mix of low cost, high value services. We'll get to that in a little more detail. All right, let's talk about organizational alignment. I don't know if you studied about you know companies that you know, at one time everybody was consolidating everything, so you consolidated all in one location, and then they said no, 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 no. We need to push all this out and push everything to everyone's subsidiary, be close to the you know to, to the business and ring. And then you talked about outsourcing, insourcing, and who knows what, I mean, whatever the, the catchphrase was, or the, the latest uh, MBA's idea of something to do would come up. And so I, I'd been through a lot of that. And so what I, uh, what I want to do is say, okay, let's just look at all these things. Every one of these sort of aspects have positives and negatives. And, and let's see which ones will work for us. Well, what we wanted to do, and it's going to cost more, I just want to put it on the higher cost end, you want to locate the value-added folks. Those are the business consultants, the analysts, the people that can work face-to-face -face with customers. You want them in the business, okay? And so that's what, what we're, we're, we're moving to, so that, so that they really feel like they're part of the team, not, you know, not from, you know, I'm Bob from Countdown. Uh, regional centers, we, because we're international, and, and our offices, many of our offices in these countries are very small. I mean, we might get one airport, and so you might only have two accounting type folks or accounting finance folks in the whole group. Well, when you have two, you have some issues with <coughs> getting the best people because you can't afford them. And, you know, I guess if you study accounting, there's this thing called segregation of duties. And so uh, we've, had, we've had our fair share of, of people you know, stealing from us because there just wasn't the right processes. We start looking at regional financial centers. In other words, we've got we've got a regional financial center in Asia. We've got a regional financial center in Latin America, and it enables us to get a higher quality of folks. We can put it in a location that is actually lower cost than here, but also easy to get to. And they had the language capabilities. They were very up on what the statutory and tax requirements were for the countries that we're in. And we felt like we needed them there because that's where we could do our best. And then finally, I think I'm okay. you guys see this? But finally on this centralized transaction processing, those things that are very proceduralized, you know, like accounts payable, and processing vendor invoices, getting out customer invoices. I mean, basically when you have a system that works well, you can do that very efficiently if you bring it all together. So, you you know, these going back to these locations, you might have to have a builder, and that location won't even have to have a builder. And so if you had 20 locations, and you really only needed three builders to do all 20, you could reduce 17, because they all had to have their own. So that's, <coughs> what we, that's that was the first thing I did, was look at our organization. How can we align it to, to meet all the needs of the company and do it in a, you know, controlled manner? Process redesign again. Identify those gaps. You know, just identify the areas that are working and those that aren't. Re-engineer for effectiveness and efficiency. We um, 
we have, they have no accounting policy or procedures. So, I mean, you know, first things first, let's get a policy manual out there. And so that everybody knows how we want to account for things. And it's interesting when you, when you go out to these locations about how things are being done. I mean, that was a huge, huge uh, benefit to getting things done the first time, done, done right the first time. Also, we want everyone to clearly understand what their roles and responsibilities are. Again, it sounds fairly basic, but you, know, you had to actually write the roles and responsibilities for positions out there. And again, strengthen risk management and controls. Uh, again, being an international company, you have to uh, not only follow the laws that are in the local countries, you have to follow the laws of the United States in those countries. So, anybody's heard about the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act and the anti boycott? And there's things that you can and can't do if you're an American citizen or you're just an American company that owns something overseas, then they have to do it. So, we had to put things in place. So. Technology. I, I, we, we did our first you know, re-engineering of the processes with our existing system. And again, it stopped the errors from, from happening. But we had a system that was 15 years old. Back then, it was, it's Oracle. Back then, they fully customized the thing so bad that they could not upgrade. So I had a, had a very expensive system that was on a version that had just been dropped by Oracle. They no longer supported it. So, I mean, there's another risk in and of itself, right? So, we started looking around. What do we need? And again, I think, I think uh, Dr. Vinnis said you guys are into SAP and, and you use SAP a lot. And I implemented SAP. And SAP is very expensive and it's very complicated. It takes a lot of training to get good at it. I have people out in these locations that are not near as sophisticated as the big companies around here that are manufacturing oil and gas petrochemicals. So we wanted something that was powerful in the ERP system, but was as intuitive. <coughs> and what we chose was uh, Microsoft Dynamics AF. Anybody, anybody hear of that? Have you heard of that yet? That is, that is Microsoft's version of an SAP or oil. They bought several different uh, packages and basically put, put them together and, and uh, Dynamics AX is the one that, that they're now selling. And it's, it's obviously robust enough that we can, we can have it in many locations. It can handle a lot of transactions. It looks like Outlook. Have you ever been on Outlook? It looks so much like Outlook. It's just very, very easy to navigate through, easy, easy to work with. Training was minimal. So we did that, we, had, we standardized our charter accounts around the world. Uh, at the same time we, did, we implemented this ERP system, we also went on a complete revamp of every one of our operating systems. We had a trip support system, we had a fuel quoting management system, and then we had a ground handling system that, that basically did all the scheduling and kept up with the parties, you know, while you're getting ready for someone to land and take off. All of that needed to be integrated with themselves and the ERP system. I mean, our customers were the same customers for every business. We, we call that the sweet spot. You know, we, we had core customers that used everything that we did. And that's our sweet spot. And, and at the same time, we tried to go, for those that didn't want to one, we still wanted to get you know, what we call direct customers to go to whatever specific product. So we had to get all that pulled together. And we needed a planning tool. And we haven't implemented it yet, but we're in the process of implementing a business intelligence, business warehouse tool to set, on, set up on top of all of these the different systems so that we can pull the operating data, we can pull the financial data, we can marry it, we can do a report in you know, 10 minutes versus a week. And then we can suddenly actually have time to look at these things and figure out what they're saying. So that was very important to me. And Finally, but not, not the least, is that our people. We had to, we had to provide <coughs> an opportunity for our people. They, most of these people, you know, everybody wants to do a good job, right? They really want to do a good job, and some of them just didn't have the tools. So here we are, we're changing the processes, we're getting those going. We are implementing a system that was reliable, 
and giving them the opportunity to do things differently, to do things better, to do other things that they didn't have time to do because they were doing things so manual. So we had to raise the bar. I mean, they've gotten kind of complacent about just doing the things the same old way they were doing. Uh, so basically we had to set the strategy, one that everybody could understand. Uh, we set, once we set the business strategy, then we had a process where everyone had goals and objectives, all the way down to that uh, county clerk, that they knew what they needed to do to meet the company goals and objectives. So we had to, we had to set that out, both short and long term. Uh, talent assessment. We basically went through a process where we looked at all of our folks, what their, what their position was, what they, what they were good at, what they needed help in, where they where they needed more training. Uh, we do a leadership profile because we're looking for leaders. We're looking to bring people up in the company. Uh, there's so much going on that uh, we grab a leader, we plug them in pretty quickly. So we wanted to see what you know what people's profiles look like and where the gaps were. We needed to do some rotations. We had people there too long in one position. So we came up with a for what we thought is our high highly mobile highly competent people, we want to give them a chance to do a little bit of everything. Because if you're, you know, when you're in a small company and the higher you get up in, in an organization, the more things you got to know about. So you needed to, to spend time in various different groups and different uh, uh, experiences. You can tell a clear vision for the current workforce. I mean, you need to tell them where we're going and you need to paint a picture of what it looks like. Do that right, and you can get people excited about where they, where, where they want to go and what they're, and they can see that what they're doing today is going to change and it's going to be better. Not, not that some unknown scary thing that's going to happen out there. And then finally, we had to do we do learning and development. We have a in-house uh, group that does training. We we actually have folks in our department that do that, that will do lunch and learn. And we did, a, we did a survey not too long ago, and, and one of the biggest areas, again, because we did so many things manual, one of the biggest areas was they wanted some more training on Excel, and pivot tables, and you know, all this other stuff. <coughs> and so we had people that were experts, and they just started doing the training, and then before you knew it, we had other departments asking us, can we come? Can you do this? Can you come do this for us? So again, trying to, trying to meet where those gaps are and try to fill them. And then finally, we, we We've had some opportunities to do talent acquisition. I've been there four years, a little over four years now, and just recently the, uh, there's another person that left the company that was reported to me, and now all the direct reports are been there probably three years or less. So I've taken the opportunity to bring people in that uh, understand and get excited about what I was trying to do and came on board. You know, that's what we've done. Now, change, everything takes change management. And I, I, I love Dilbert. I don't think anybody listen, reads Dilbert every day, but the thing about Dilbert to me that makes him so funny is he gets so close to the truth. So close to the truth. And uh, we actually hired a director of change. And, uh, and, and he had got a lot of good ideas. And he spot on, but he did not work in our culture and didn't, didn't survive. But again, you just need to have something that people can get, get on board with. If it's, if it's a good strategy and it's, they see it's good for them, most people are willing to go. So anytime you, you, you kind of take on something like this, and this has been a three-year journey for me right now, there's always things you can learn. Things you can do better. So I, I want to sort of summarize the things that from when we started to where we are today. Again, the vision. I talked about the vision. You know, you've got to know what your organization looks like. You've got to implement change management processes. And, and it's, it's nothing magical. It's just getting people involved, letting them know what's going to happen and what their role is. But you've got to do that all the time. You've got to constantly do that. And again, communicate what you're doing. Communicate it again, and then just when you think you've got everybody understanding it, you've got to communicate it again. So that is the most important thing. you got to make people a priority because you're not going to get there. You can't change them unless they're, they're 
there with you, helping you do it. That's very important. Doing a good plan, a good roadmap, and have key milestones. The interesting thing about our, our company is we never lack for our people. And we, we, our company culture is kind of a little ADD because they want to do all these things and they want to do them all at once. When I first got there, they were doing 20 things and they weren't finishing any of them. So in trying to get them to understand if you actually prioritize and maybe do one or two at a time, you might get some things done. Um, we're getting much better at it, but every, it seems like every new budget period, all this stuff pops up again. And they want to make it, you know, so now we're back to prioritizing. So it's very important to do that. Uh, got to have IT on your side. You got to have them every block step of the way in order to give people the tools they need to do their job. And we, we just hired a new CIO. It's real exciting because he's been on. He's been in some of the industrial side. He's also been on the retail side. And, and, and you guys know more than I do about all the things that are going on with with computers, with phones, you know, what with the internet. And, and he's. He's already kind of pushing us to where we're going to have as many things as we can for ourselves and for our customers on um, And then again, uh, our goal is to be world class. But once we've got all this done, you know, world class is not an end point. It's just really, okay, now we got that done. Now what's the next goal? What's the next goal? How, how, how do we raise the bar the next time? And so that's sort of what we're doing. Um, nobody asked any questions, but I would love to answer any questions about anything. Yes, sir. How long after implementation uh, did it, did you see positive figures? I mean, I'm sure that you're still seeing the effects, but was it the next quarter? Was it instantaneous? Well, um, again, go back to this change management. Plan. The first place that we implemented AX, we decided was Singapore. And the finance manager, Singapore. Singapore is a big enough operation that they had like four people in it. So the person that was running it wasn't necessarily on board. And it took us three months, and actually we had to keep sending people back there every close to help them get the, get the close to because they just couldn't, they didn't do the training, they weren't really on board, it took a while. The next two implementations, when we did it in China, and we did it in Australia, well, Australia, uh, kicked us out the door, said, we got this. They closed in two days, which they always took two weeks. And then the Chinese, I mean, they just, they loved it. They took it over very quickly. So it just depends on you know, where you're at. And, and uh, Latin America, with our uh, shared service group, uh, we were able to implement things fairly well. Again, when you create a new organization that's, that's a regional center, you're, you're hiring people that are not necessarily up to speed with how you do things or even your industry. And so I was bringing those folks on at the same time we were trying to implement in various countries. And there was a little bit of, yeah, it was a little hard going for a while because the country managers didn't know if they wanted them to take over, they didn't trust them, they were learning the business. But it didn't take but a couple of months for both sides were working Right now, we're we're in the middle of completing it here in the United States, and we just can't wait. We've got a we've got an invoice that is so incomprehensible. I mean, it, it was written a long time ago. We probably have twice as many services. It was it was customized. You can't even change the cop the, the, the lines on the invoice. And it's just it's a disaster, and our customers are screaming and hollering. So that's 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 our biggest challenge this year. Yes. Uh, I'm curious, your chief financial officer and your presentation is it focusing on what you have done within the chief financial, the accounting, the financial aspects of the organization, or are your ideas extending into <coughs> the other units that? Certainly they have an accounting and financial aspect, but they're operational, whereas what you're talking about seems like it's sort of an organizational 
structure, behavior, sure. goal? Well, it has bled over. I mean, I, I tried to lead by example and show them. Uh, again, what we do is it's pretty, it's pretty unique, okay? And I, I say that our, our operational folks have this kind of culture, hero culture. That's what I call it. I mean, things happen and they just come to the rescue and they just do whatever it takes to make sure that that trip stays on plan and is successful. Well, everybody had their own idea of how to do that. So we have not only six trip support teams and all six of them were doing things differently. Same basic service, but doing it differently. And then within the team, they were doing it differently. So now the COO is, he's kind of bought into this. We need to, we need to write processes. We need to find out how much of this service should be routine and we can do the same repeatable process. And then how much is the, you know, the, the heroic, you know, doing the last, you know, whatever the last thing is. So they are looking at that. We've, we've actually been helping them document the processes and trying to, well, Document and then trying to say which one do you want <laughs> to, to start with. So it is it, it is working the cultural aspect. We started working on now. It's a it's a company wide. We have kind of great culture, but there's a couple of things that inhibit us going further, and we need to the whole company needs to focus on that. So now we are uh, implementing the system. You know, I we we showed some we showed some ability to have some success, to focus on setting a priority, setting a, a basically, <coughs> not having scope creep, set the scope, and then get it done. And then once you did that, then you do phase two, because you always think of things to do. But if you keep thinking of them and you keep trying to do them, it never gets done. So that was, again, another thing that they weren't, they weren't very good at. So I, I think we have greatly influenced the whole organization. And I work very closely with our, our president and our CEO. And uh, again, that's, that's, that's been a big key as well. Yes? You had that slide where basically you had uh, completely decentralized systems at one end and completely centralized at the other. It just seems to me that what you're doing is finding the right balance. So, can, do you have some examples you could share of things that you thought would be better centralized and then they weren't, and things that were better decentralized and then they weren't? Well, billing is a good good example. Billing does lend itself mm -hmm. to a very routine. Uh, you can set things up and do it very quickly. But in our company, I mean, I've never been anywhere. I've been a lot of companies. I've never been anywhere that was so intensely customer focused. They can never tell the customer no. And I mean, it's made, and they don't like it to know. So, I mean, it's an interesting, you know, you don't ever say, no, you shouldn't do that, or, or no, we can't do that. What I do is, uh, not now. That's about as close as I get to know or Not now. But what we're going to do is, we're going to, in that group that's going to be close to the business, we're going to have, especially the big, the big ones like TSS and Fuel, we're going to have a person that work that is a in the billing department, but is embedded in the company, so that they can spend, they can be going with them to talk to customers, they can address customer issues, and again, you, you can't, you got to understand the business more than just doing processing. So that's one thing that we decided we needed to have, instead of having everything in the centralized, we can centralize the core activity, but then let's have some people still in the business. Because again, we're there to, to, uh, to serve the business. We're there to help them get things done so that they can be successful. And you've got to, you've got to understand that the biggest thing I can tell you if you're going to, if you're going to go into a business as an accountant or in treasury or whatever, is intensely study and understand what that business does and how that company within that industry, how they get things done. Because once you fully understand that, you're going to be much more of a resource and, and, and a talent to that business than if you're just processing cash flow or accounting transactions or whatever. But that's, 
that's one. Um, what about the other way? Something that you thought would be better denaturalized if you pulled it after the time you keep that maybe and maybe there aren't any of them. Well, everybody wants their own cat. They want to manage that they they think they want to control the therapist and the cat. And I had you know, I I looked at that and I'm like, oh, no, no, it's the company's cash. It's a very important resource. And companies never have enough cash. Okay? They never have enough cash to do what they want to do. So you centralize the cash and then you sit down and say, okay, you know, you three business guys, I've only got so much, and you guys decide who's going to get it. So that it, it doesn't work as it's held for it. <laughs> they literally, even though they don't need it, they'll, they'll want to keep it on their in their account and their subsidiary versus bringing it forward. So we just tell them, no, nope, everything is all cash is managed all around the world. All cash is managed at corporate. Yeah. Yes, sir. I know there's not like a set. Uh, an instructions manual for this, but like, what would be your advice for somebody that might possibly want to be a CFO of a company one day? Well, if you look at CFOs, they come in all colors. I mean, some of them are come in from the business side. There's a lot of engineers that I guess either they don't they don't like engineering, they go on the finance side, and, and then from from the business side, lots of accountants become CFOs. Now, being an accountant doesn't mean that you're going to be a good CFO. You need to you need to do as many of the disciplines as possible within the finance function. I mean, you've got accounting, you've got treasury, you've got analysis, you've got M and A work. Um, you know, some people go through internal audits because it gives you a chance to go through. A lot of different businesses and different departments. You have got to be broad. And you can't be, you know, this broad and, and this deep. There's a couple of things that you should be an expert in. But then you need to learn everything else. You know, my expertise started off in accounting. Now I got a hand, I don't know that I go back into accounting again. I mean, maybe this is somebody off of it. <laughs> I looked today, and I, when, I, when I got my CPA, there were 33 pasties. Okay, 33. How many are there today? 100 and... Well, they don't even call them pasties anymore, right? Well, when I, when I brought the new controller into my department, I looked at him and I said, I'm not the accountant, I'm retired. This is your Just make sure it's right. And unfortunately, I know enough about accounting to ask questions. At least I can get to the root of things. It's gotten very, very complicated. And I mean, I hate to say it, but it's just my opinion. And obviously, it's not the opinion of the county profession, but I think they've gotten too routine, too many rules based. You know, they're trying to create a process or a procedure for every outcome that could happen, right? And, you know, that's why they can't get the least accounting one finished. That thing is the most ugliest thing you've ever seen. So yeah, I'm I'm good at that. I don't want to do it anymore. But you need to have a broad base. If you can work in a business, if you can actually run a division, that too helps you be the CFO because you have to be, you are the advisor to the CEO. He relies on you to understand his business. To, to be able to give them advice for them to, to, to trust you. Now, uh, does anybody want to be a CFO? One day? Uh, does anybody look at, uh, what's the average tenure of a CFO? Nothing like that? Short. Sure. Uh, right here. Two to three. three. Wow. You better get a good track. <laughs> you better get a good contract. Um, Again, i tell you why. I mentioned this, I spent about <clears throat> almost 10 years in the private equity, and I worked for four different companies. And a 
again, when you're like the number two or number three guy, you know, you're on the hot seat. And things, whether it's your fault or not, things go wrong. And I can promise you that CEO, he's got one get out of jail card, and that's the CFO. <laughs> you know, he can blame you once. And he can get another one, and if it happens again, it's him. And that happens. I work for a company called Gungle, and uh, they had one contract that was 35% of their total EBITDA. And that contract, three years into it, came open. The market had changed. It was a, a buyer's market because there was oversupply in what they did. And this company, we won the business, but boy, our, our, our margins went from here to here. And then the PE firms comes in and says, okay, we're going we're gonna to cut that much cost. We lost that much margin. We're going to cut that much cost. And I looked at him and I said, not there. There's the company. I said, you're not going to find that. Of course, they'd already decided to bring in a consultant that poured through all of our books. And, and at the end of it, they couldn't find it. But I chose to get out of that one because it just, the writing was on the wall. So it is interesting. I mean, you got you got to have the ability to, to land on your feet. Uh, you you got to have a pretty thick skin. And be pretty confident in yourself because you know there's always another one. There's plenty of opportunity out there. You just got to go find it. But it is a precarious <laughs> position. Yes, sir. What would you say is the most important characteristics of um, graduates? from DBA programs today, going into business? What would you look for? What, what, is, what properties, characteristics are most important? Well, a couple of things. I think you got to be willing to learn and to continue to learn because you never stop. And you've got to be open to, 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 to doing that. Because you, you know, I don't know, I, I thought I knew it all. You know, I was going to be a, an auditor. <laughs> I thought, man, I knew it all when I came out of school. I even had a big eight accounting uh, partner come teach watching that year, and I sit in his class. I didn't know anything about all this. I mean, I had to completely just learn it all different. And they'll they'll teach you if you learn. So that that and the willingness, uh, the willingness to, to get out there and work. thing about Universal is that you know they don't we're adequately staffed. We don't try to work our people in the ground. We really believe in work life balance. But there are times when you've got to crank something out. Like this 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 weekend we were working on a new proposal for a very large potential customer. And we had to be working the whole weekend to get that thing out. It was due at five o'clock on Monday. And you know we expected folks to sacrifice that weekend just to get that done. Do we, do that? we don't do that every weekend. We haven't done that in probably six months. But when you got to do it, you need to be ready and you know, be willing and able and ready. But those are two things I think that we're having a hard time sometimes getting folks that you know, they want to be there six months and they want to back they want to do it one month. don't want to be partner. It's a very good path. And why is that? You will work doing auditing. You will work at many companies in one year. And you will see many different industries. You will see many different issues. And you'll have to help figure out how to resolve those issues. If you go to a company, so if, if, if you're doing an annual report one time a year, So I think if your your desire is to, to move up, if your desire is to be a CFO, controller, or whatever, you need to get some good experience quickly to, to get on that pathway. Yeah. <coughs>
international business from the U.S. business. Businesses are, make, they, they come up with an idea, they got something that, that, that somebody wants, that creates value, that creates a profit. I mean, that's, a, that's pretty universal all around the world. Um, again, I don't know if you're going to learn anything, you got you don't know what should you do. I mean, every country's different. Well, that's why I created some I bring people in that kind of in that area to do the taxes and the, and the uh, <coughs> pardon me, the statutory stuff because it's so different and so specific to that country. So I don't know what you would do at this level to prepare you internationally, other than travel. You get a chance to go overseas now, travel, see all the cultures. That's always fascinating. Because that's how that's the difference. That's when you work in different different countries, it's how they do things. And it's and it's all cultural and things. Any other questions? Thank you so much for coming.